for each day that you give to us to live for your honor, for your glory, your praise. We thank you for making us in your image. and We pray that you would help us to more accurately reflect that image as we study your word, uh, both the Old and the New Testament. Pray that you would bless our time of study in the Hebrew language today, that we might be um, better equipped to study your Old Testament Word, Lord, we want to have a firm grasp on the sword of the Spirit. So bless our understanding, we, we pray, that, that we might know more of you, love more of you, and more better understand your glory. We long for a taste, oh Lord, another taste of your glory this day as we gather in your house. We pray these things in your name, amen. Alright, today we're going to study the Hifil um, verbal system in in Hebrew. The we've already studied the cow, and if you get out your synopsis of strong verb, we've already studied the cow. Uh, we looked at the pl and the puel. The cow is just the basic verb tense, if you remember, and then the pl was a more intensive um, verbal system, kind of intensified the the cow. The pu'al was the passive of the pl, and today we're going to study, just jump over hit pile for a minute, we're going to study the hifil and the hafal today. And the, the hifil is a very important part of the Hebrew verbal system. If you remember, um, we had some statistics a little earlier, there are 72 Thousand, approximately 72,000 verbs in the Hebrew Old Testament. And approximately 51,000 of those are in the cow system. So that only leaves us with, you didn't think you'd come to a math class today, did you? That only leaves us with 21,000 verbs. And in the Hifil system, which we're going to consider today, that's a, we have about 9,500 verbs in the Hifil, approximately. I have the exact statistic here. 9,496 are in the Hifil. So, almost half, so if you know the cow, you've got almost 70% of the verbs in the Hebrew Old Testament. You take away the cow, we have 21,000, almost half of those are in the hifil. I was wondering last night, I wonder which is the second most used after the cow. Is it the hifil or the pl? Well, just to throw in some more uh, trivia, the pl is used almost 6,500 times. 6,473 is the pl. So not quite as much as the hifil, but still quite a lot. So the hifil, what we're going to be learning today, the pl is what we've already got in our memory bank, and we're going to cover the hafal too. If you look at your uh, strong verb chart, the hafal there is the final bottom column. The hafal is very rare. Um, I only rec- remember coming on maybe one or two in all my translation studies um, thus far. The hafal is used a meager 396 times in the Hebrew Old Testament. Now, we believe every word of God is pure. Those hafal verbs are important. We're going to cover them. But not nearly as um, utilized as the hifil or the pl, and certainly not as much as the cow. So there's some statistics for you. So what is the hifil? We, we've seen the regular um, active verbs in the cow system in the Hifil, I like the Hifil. Pastor Carl liked the Hifil. It was an easy one to get excited about. The Hifil is the... It's an active verb with causative element. It, um, it shows forth the sovereignty of God in the Old Testament. I like the... Um, Hifil for that reason. Um, 
shows that God is doing something, that He's, he's the, the first cause of all that comes to pass. Um, it's those kind of thoughts that bring you comfort when you're laying in a parking lot trying to change the starter on your car in the pouring down rain, and you're thinking, God caused this for some reason. Maybe just to grow my faith and <laughs> cause me to uh, trust Him. And did get that starter changed, by the way. The policeman in the next parking lot, security never never showed up. So, drove that, cranked that car three times yesterday. All right, causative types of action. And how we translate this, when you're working with the Hifil system, you want to translate it with the English words, he caused him, we'll speak in masculine, general, he caused him or he made him to do something. Translate with You can, plot, you can supply your he, she, or it, they, or them, caused, or you want to capture the, the causative element of the hifil. It's, it's very important that they're trying to tell you something in the hifil, that there's a, there's a cause, a, a, a force, if you will, at work behind um, a hifil verb. You don't just want to translate it like a cow. There, there's, a, there's an important element to the hifil that needs to be captured in with the English terms made, he, she, or it, made, he, she, or it, do something, he, she, or it, caused something. So used made or caused, um, I usually just used caused, working through my translation. You get to the end, you can polish it over, uh, work through the, um, work through the uh, syntax, the linguistics of, of the, the passage. So supply those English terms when you're translating a hifil. And now we're going to look at the hifil paradigm. We've done this before with the cow, and we'll show you with the hifil. It's important we get the regularity. I promised you at the beginning that the, the Hebrew uh, system is very, very regular. Um, all of the prefixes and suffixes denoting uh, person, case, and gender remain unchanged across all the verbal landscapes. The cow, the nifal, the hifil, pl, puau. Each of those verbal systems is going to bring their own set of characteristic vowels and such, but the prefixes and the suffixes are going to remain largely unchanged. So let's look at our uh, hifil in the perfect. The hifil perfect. Let's go ahead and write these over here. Third masculine singular. We're going to keep using our good old katal. This is the third masculine singular, which is going to show you, because it's uninflected, it's the most base uh, form of any, any verb in any verbal system. We have some identifying um, characteristics with the hifil. And again, like the PL and the PUAL before it, the hifil, the name itself, bears some semblance with the way the verb is spelled or, or conjugated. We have a hey with a hiric as a prefix of sorts. And you have the hiric yud, the long vowel, before the final ground form consonant. Or what are our ground form consonants here in this verb? Right. Reading in the English direction, kof tet lama in the Hebrew, yes. Those are our ground form consonants. The verb is katal. This is it conjugated in the third masculine singular in the hifil. So it's hik-til is how we would pronounce it. 
And it means in the third masculine singular, he caused to kill. So that's how you would translate in the third masculine singular. Let's keep going, move on to the second, or the third feminine singular, I'm sorry. Third feminine singular, just as regular, keeps with all of our standard third feminine singular endings that we've already learned. The comet's hay, but it gives the hifil characteristics <coughs> with the hay and then the hiric yud. Hik tila. She made to kill or caused to kill. Second, second uh, masculine singular. And this one, because of the, the strong comets pulling at the end of this one, The Hiric Yud is shortened to a comet under the Tet. We notice that the suffix remains unchanged. The He and the Hiric prefix is unchanged. Have a little vowel reductionism going on here. But you know it's a Hifil. You're working through. Katal should jump off the page at you. Oh, that's, that's a... Um, the ground form of the, the verb, right there. The hay tips you off. If you're reading it in the direction of the Hebrew, you see a hiric yud on a verb, hifil, think hifil. It's not going to be a, a definite article. It's likely going to be a, a hifil if it's got the um, hay and the hiric. So you've got your uh, second masculine singular prefix or suffix there, I'm sorry. In the second feminine singular, we have, again, standard second feminine singular ending, which is the, instead of the tet with the comets, it's the tet with the shiva, the silent shiva, which means this shiva comes vocal. So, that is the uh, second feminine singular, she caused to kill. Again, we see the, the, the patak, the vowel reduction, staying there. The suffixes all remaining the same. First common singular, it, it goes on. The, the, the hay uh, remains present for all of the perfect hifils. Some of the opposition that you see between the vowels is due to the presence of the suffixes pulling on the vowels within the, the verb. That was the terminology that Pastor Carl used with me. And I can get you, if you so desire, I can get you the uh, notes from his seminary course when he went through Hebrew uh, that will help you understand some more of the opposition that vowels have toward one another. I can say that <laughs> those notes, at least to me, maybe not to you, hopefully not, were, were rather confusing. Um, didn't find them so helpful, but... found it better just to memorize the um, verbs as much as possible. And then, uh, generally, the verb is not usually hiding. That is, the ground form of a verb is not usually hiding. It's not trying to fool you, be something else. Uh, every now and then you have some very unusual opposition that really will change something drastically. There you go. 
That's all but the first common. We're going to put the first common up here. Run out of room. First common in the perfect. We have our new um, suffix there. So as you can see, no new um, suffixes to use. They're all the same. You have your Tim and your ten for the second masculine plurals. All the singulars still the same with the with the um, Tav. The third feminine carries the same comet say, and the common plural has the long new ending. So no, nothing new there. And the Hifil designated frequently by the presence of a Hiric Yud before the final ground form consonant, but always in the perfect designated by the Hifil performative, or the, the, the hey and the hiric is the hifil performative. So that's the hifil in the perfect. Now let's look at the hifil in the imperfect. And the imperfect, as you remember, is the... Okay, sure, go ahead. So the hifil in the imperfect is... Um, same as the, the, the cow as far as translation goes, you want to supply the will that goes with the imperfect, and then you also want to supply the, either the English word made or cause that comes with the hifil. So you want to carry over um, as much as possible both of those in order to have the more accurate um, rendering. So, <laughs> so for the, the hifil being the causative, the, the hafal, we'll go ahead and jump to the hafal while y'all are still writing. The hafal is merely the passive of the hifil. There's not... Um, there's not any well you obviously you want to supply it with the passive you want to put it in the passive voice um, he, wa he or she was made to render it in the, the as you would a, a passive in English so some of these verbal systems on your synopsis sheet you have um, the cow you have the PL and the hifil, and then each of these has a, um, a passive um, connected with them. The passive of the pl is the puau. The passive of the hifil is the hafau. Um, the hitpiel and the nifau are both reflexives, and we'll get to those soon enough. Um, Y'all good? Everybody got the hifil perfect? Okay, we'll move on to the imperfect. The imperfect of the hifil is a little bit strange. As we saw in the hifil perfect, the hay with the hiric is standing out to us, letting us know that this is a hifil. Um, in the imperfect, what's the difference between the imperfect and the perfect? Not, not talking about translation as far as the Hebrew syntax is concerned, the, the conjugation. The perfect has suffixes. The imperfect has prefixes. Um, as you know, a prefix goes before a word. Suffix comes after a word. So in the imperfect, you've got a prefix that has to be factored in. What does this do to our hay and our hiric? Well, there's, uh, they are elided, is the word in English, which means the hay disappears. But in the hifil, um, that, that elision uh, is going to be distinguished by the um, vowel that's going to appear underneath the imperfect prefix. So if you remember in the cow system, if you have your um, 
synopsis or your, um, your study guide chart, you see under the um, yud, in the imperfect, you have a, in the cal, if you look at the cal imperfect on your synopsis chart, you have a hyric underneath the yud. Well, in the hifil, if you jump down to the hifil and look at the imperfect, we have, of course, the hyric and the yud, the long vowel before the final ground form consonant, but we also have a patak underneath the yud, not a hyric. So, as I mentioned uh, in previous lectures, when a Hebrew letter drops out, it's going to denote its absence. It's going to leave you a uh, note of absence, let you know something's dropped out, whether it's in the presence of a doggish, of a vowel being lengthened. Uh, it's going to let you know, hey, something dropped out here. So let's jump into the, he- the Hifil imperfect. There we go. The Hifil imperfect. Let's see. Let's look at it in the third masculine singular. Which, what's the... I just, just told you just a moment ago. What is the prefix for an imperfect in Hebrew? What's the, what's the consonant? Uh, yes, that's the English word we supply. It's a yud is the Hebrew letter. Sorry if I didn't phrase that correctly. It's a yud. And in the third masculine singular, we have our yud prefix. Instead of a hyric, we have patak. Oh, some change is taking place. And because there are no suffixes in the imperfect, the hyric yud before the final ground form consonant that's characteristic of the hifil is left to stand. There's nothing, there's no vowels pulling, no opposition going on there. It's left to stand as it is. And in the imperfect, it is in every single form except for the, the second and third Feminine plural. So let me go ahead and put these on the board for you. Try to do a little better spacing it out. So the third feminine singular, y'all know the performative for this one, or you should, is the tav. You may have to do just the singulars first and then the plurals. And I know I'm blocking you guys from writing. So that is the third feminine singular. And then, oh, as we remember from the cow, in the imperfect, the third feminine singular and the second masculine singular are the same. Still true in the hifil. Nothing's changed. Sometimes change is good, but I rather like uniformity. I like things to be simple, straightforward, uncomplicated. And then in the imperfect, we do have the second feminine carries with it the hyric yud suffix. But guess what? That does not affect the hyric yud um, that comes with the Hifil, it is left to stand also. So then the first common singular have the olive. The olive takes a patak in the hifil. So there's the singulars. I'll do the plurals because those those imperfect plurals they're they're long. There's your singulars. You see you have all of the prefixes that we had in the cow. Nothing's changed. The vowel has changed underneath them. The hay has dropped off. But again, they they didn't leave you without a sign that this is a hifil. You have your hyric yuds running all the way through. So it's still letting you know this is a hifil, not trying to fool you. But the hay, as we're going to learn, we haven't gotten into what's called final hay verbs. Those are going to be fun. I'm still working on those. Final hay verbs. The hay is a weak consonant in Hebrew. There's a number of what's called weak consonants. The hay, 
the yud, the nun, and those, those consonants will drop off of the beginning or end of certain verbs. Don't panic. It's not like the Greek. It's much easier than the Greek, I promise. Those, those consonants will drop off, disappear, and they will, like I mentioned earlier, they will let, leave you a note of absence letting you know that they are gone, but they're conjugated somewhat differently, as you might expect, and they can be rather hard to parse if you're working through your Hebrew text. You come across one that's like, well, this, this uh, verb doesn't have enough ground form consonants. I, don't, I can't find a, a, a ground, enough ground form consonants. Well, the first place you need to go to holiday, your lexicon, look for a nun or a hey or a yud that has dropped off at the beginning or end of a Hebrew verb. But there's the imperfect, the singulars. First person, second person, and third person. So they've all got the hyric yud, all the, the preformatives or the uh, prefixes, and the one suffix in the second feminine all stayed the same. So, blessed uniformity, yes. Yes. Yes, in the hit field, they're all, you want to supply the uh, caused or made. Um, the, the imperfect, you want to supply the word will, because it's showing that there's still, it's imperfect, the verb isn't completed yet. Um, so, for example, for example, maybe this is, this will be helpful. In the third masculine singular, in the Hebrew, this is going to be rough, but he will make to kill. He will make to kill. That, you capture the essence of the imperfect with the, the um, will supplied there, and then make in the singular... He will make to kill. So you've got your third masculine singular bound up in he, imperfect bound up in will, and the hifil bound up in the word make. Does that help? Sorry, I think I should have done that a little bit earlier. And then depending on the person number and gender, that will change ever so slightly. Um, lost my eraser. Here it is. The, the imperfect... Is, is supplied with will. It doesn't mean that the verb wasn't done. Obviously, every action done in the Old Testament is thousands of years completed by this point. But it means that there's still oftentimes an ongoing um, function of that verb, that you know, the action is being planned sometimes. So, yes, good question, Ms. Jones. That... Uh, Should have explained that a um, little bit earlier. In the imperfect, now we're going to go to the plurals. Um, give you that um, paradigm. So for the first, or for the third, we've been doing the third. We'll stick with the third and go work down. It's actually the opposite of how I learned it. I started with the first person up top and then went down. But uh, Van Pelt, they like to do So there you go. There's the third common plural in the imperfect. You have just one plural for the third person. You have your yud, again a patak. You have your um shurek, the suffix there, and then the second masculine. Plural in the imperfect, you have, again, the same. Tav, performative, or prefix, rather. I'm using my terms here. Begin with the shurik. The second feminine, the second feminine has that big second and uh, let's see, 
that big old ending on it. The nun with the comets and then the hay. Let's see here. I think this one may actually be third masculine plural. Messed myself up. So the third. Okay, second feminine. Yes. So we'll jump down here now and do our third feminine plural. I'm sorry. The third feminine plural is the same as the second. That's how I knew I'd made a mistake there. We do have the second and third feminine plural that's the same in the imperfect. It's conjugated the same way. So my apologies about that. All right, in the first common, we have the nun prefix. So I hope that didn't mess you all up too bad. Okay, there we go. There's the imperfect. In the third masculine plural, we have the yud. The, the yud uh, prefix, always when we think in third masculine, third masculine, third masculine, because in the, in the plural and in the, the singular, it carries the yud. The tavs that we saw all the way down with the um, second person. The feminine is the same. Kind of ran stuff together there. We have that huge um, ending, the nun with the comets and the hay, that causes some um, vowel changes. We have a sere instead of the hiric yud in the second and third feminine plural. And you might go, well, there, there goes all my distinguishing signs of the hifil. I don't have a hiric yud to judge by. I don't have a hey. How am I supposed to know that's a hifil? Well, this is where vowels are key. You know it's a hifil. You have your patak instead of a hiric underneath your prefix, and you have a lengthened vowel. It's not the hiric yud, no, but you have a lengthened vowel underneath your second ground form consonant in the second and third feminine plural. So you're not left without any indication. Those second and third feminine plurals can be a little bit tricky because they have both prefixes and uh, suffixes in the imperfect, and that causes some vowel changes. But you, are, you do still have some signs, and you know it's a hifil? See these vowels there? They're not going to be... There's not going to be another uh, tense that's going to parse it in exactly the same way. It's, it, another tense is going to conjugate it somewhat differently. So, translate these. Uh, if we put it in the third masculine singular, let's see here. That would be um, they... They will make to kill. Or you could do they will cause killing. <laughs> Might be another way to render it. But that would be the... Um, Third masculine rendering of those. And you just change as you go down for the um, second and the first. So, in the, in the hifil, it's a very important um, part of the Hebrew verbal system. We've seen, we've seen how to identify in the perfect and the imperfect some changes that, that go on. The hifil is important because it's the causative. For um, some who may have walked in a little bit later, the hifil is the causative in Hebrew. It's, it's supplied with uh, the English words make or cause, like the imperfect tense. It su um, supplies the word will. 
and the Hiphil shows forth the sovereignty of God. It, it's, it's, it's wonderful to work through the Hebrew text and see one example. Uh, when Abraham and Sarah were given the promise that from Abraham would come a great nation, the Lord was going to make him numerous, and Abraham's, I have only this Eliezer of Damascus for my heir. I don't even have any children. The Lord said, son from your own loins is going to be your heir. Don't, don't worry about it. And in Genesis 17, verse 2, I think it is, we have the verb to, be, to make numerous or become numerous. It's in the hip field, and the Lord says, I will make you numerous. I will cause you to be numerous. As Christians, and especially Reformed Christians, uh, we, we rejoice when we, when we see things like that. The sovereignty, the omnipotence of God at work is, is it's not limited to, but you can see it clearly in some of these Hebrew verbal aspects. It's very, very remarkable, wonderful to see. Um, so as me and Pastor Carl, we, we're, we're Reformed, we like the Hifil. Shows forth the sovereignty of God. And the Hafal is um, the passive. I want to cover the Hafal just briefly, uh, and then we'll move on to some vocabulary words before we run out of time. The Hafal, I don't actually have a full paradigm for the Hafal. I'll give you some diagnostics, some characteristics of the Hafal. Um, like I said, the, the, of the 72,000, approximately 72,000 verbs in the Old Testament, um, 396 are hafals. So very sparse usage there. And it's similar to the, the hifil. Um, the hafal is passive of hifil. Okay, go to Dr. Greenberg here. He gives us a, what he calls a skeletal paradigm in, the, uh, in his work. And he uses the verb um, shalak to uh, throw. We're actually going to keep with... Uh, Katal. So in the Hafal, you still have the He performative. And if you're looking at your synopsis chart, you'll see that the, that the Hafal has a lengthened vowel underneath its He performative. And the vowel is going to differ in the Hafal between the Kibbutz and the Comets. You're going to see both. Those are both strong Vowels. Okay. And then you have the potok. If you again refer to your um, synopsis chart, you'll see the, the potok underneath the... This is the third masculine... Whoops, not, not plural. Singular in the perfect. The hafal perfect. There we go. Carries the um, the hey preformative lengthened vowel a class or u class, and then a potok. Look at your uh, synopsis chart that you have there, and you'll see that under the middle ground form consonant for all of the half vowels, it's an a class vowel except for the infinitive absolute. You have a sere. So the A-class vowel under the middle ground form consonant is a good sign you might be working with a ha vowel. Very few, if you, if you go up and look at your uh, synopsis chart, under the tet, which is our middle ground form consonant, you'll see that very few of them in the conjugated tenses outside of the perfect have A-class vowels underneath the tet. But the ha vowel, all the way through till you get to the infinitive absolute. So that's a good um, I didn't plan to do this, but we're going to try to uh, translate a half al third masculine singular in the in the imperfect and see what uh, see what we get. So again, we have the yud, 
with either a comet or kibbutz. So you got a lot going on. You have a, a passive of the hifil in the imperfect tense, third masculine singular. There's a lot going on there. And then I'll give you uh, one more. He gives us the participle of the hafal. And it comes with the mem performative. With the kibbutz underneath it. And then we have, for the participle, we have the comets. If you look at your um, synopsis chart, the hafal participle, um, we have, erase that, we have the Comets underneath the middle ground form consonant there. Still an A-class vowel like the Potok. Comets or kibbutz. Dr. Greenberg gives a kibbutz. My synopsis from Pastor Call puts a comets. Either one. Um, you'll know it's not a pu'al because of the A-class vowel under the middle ground form consonant. So there's the ha vowel. Now, let, let's, I didn't prepare to do this, but we're, we're going to... Uh, See what we got here. Let's try to translate a third masculine singular imperfect of the ha vowel. So we're trying to put it in the cause. It has to be causative. You need to supply will because it's an imperfect. And then you want to supply, uh, you want to put it in the passive voice because it's a ha vowel, not a hifil. So let's see here. How would we do this? We start with he because it's third masculine singular. Let me go over here. Got some acreage on the board over here. So we start with a he. And then, (laughs) y'all help me out here. My translation committee. Let's see. He will be made to be killed. Ooh, that's a town. That sounds dark. Uh, There we go. He will be made to be killed. (laughs) <laughs> That's my best shot at rendering a third masculine singular imperfect in the ha foul for the verb katal. So, <laughs> as you can see, the ha foul is kind of clunky. Don't really, don't really appear a lot in Hebrew. <coughs> Excuse me. But that's how you would render this one. That's how I would render it. And then... You work through the rest of the verse, rest of the passage if you need to, rest of the book if you need to, and you can go back and polish that up, make it fit um, in the English grammar. So there's the, there's the hafal. You've got the hafal, the hifil. Let's go back to our synopsis chart. You've got the cow. We looked at the pl. Got that. Got the puau. Got the hifil and the hafal. All we have left on our synopsis to look at is the nifal, and the hit pile. And those are going to be, they come with their own set of uh, identifying um, characteristics. They, they are reflexive. The nif is reflexive, I believe the hit pile is as well. And we'll cover those in weeks to come. And then you'll have most of the Hebrew verbal system. There are very few other, there are, are, there are a few other uh, verbal systems that are used like the hit palel and the hishtafel, but the, you can count on both hands the number of times those verbs are used in the Old Testament with some of these other verbal systems. So they're very, used very uh, sparsely and we'll, we'll cover them in passing as we come to them. But now for some vocabulary... I want to give you a sample, some Hebrew words. Ha, there they are. Some more verbs, a few different things before we close it out for today. This is a, we'll open it up with a verb this time. Again, all the verbs that we do are in the third masculine singular, which is the lexical form. It's the form you're going to find it in your dictionary or lexicon in. 
Somebody want to try pronouncing that one for me? Zakar, yes. And it means I will or I remember. I remember. Zakar. To remember, to recall, call to mind. You know, when the Lord says, I remember the covenant that I made. Well, obviously God didn't forget anything, but He's calling to mind. He's saying, I'm going to act on this now. I made the promise. The time is fulfilled to keep it. So, zakar. Very, very uh, important verb. And then I'll throw in a, a bonus for you. Zaker is memory. And this is characteristic of, of a lot of Hebrew words. The verb and the noun are oftentimes related. And in a lot of cases, the consonants are all the same. The vowels are just changed. That helps you. You kind of get two for one. You see um, the Zion, the cough, and the Raish. You don't think it's something related to memory. You can parse it and find out if it's a verb or the noun. The noun is probably not going to be inflected that often. might have a pronominal suffix, something else we have to get to. But this one is used uh, 235 times in the uh, Old Testament. 235 times, so an important verb. Now, another important one. All right, how about that one? Shavat. Shavat. Now that sounds like a word we read the transliteration of all the time in the Old Testament. Sabbath. Sabbath. Exactly. It is, it's a verb. This is a verbal form. It's not the noun Sabbath. It's the verbal form. And it means to stop, cease, or rest. The Lord's Day, is, or the Sabbath, is a day of rest. Day of rest. Stop your labors, cease from your labors to rest. And the noun form, you'll have that doggish line in there that will give you the B pronunciation. So Shavat turns into Shabbat, Sabbath. Sabbath. Important, bound up in the fourth commandment. All right, here's a little simple word that's used over 1,600 times. Yod. Yod. This word means hand, side, and then it's also used as a metaphor, power. Hand, side, metaphorically <laughs> spell metaphorically right oh I did yes metaphorically power yod used over 1600 times in the old testament so, when you talk about the Lord having a strong right hand, this is the Hebrew word that's behind that um, English translation. Yod. Yod. All right, just a couple more, and then we're going to have to... We're going to have to end it. We have another word... You remember our uh, direct object marker that also means with the whole eight thing. We got another word that's similar. This one is off. Off. Final form pay. And this one, this, this, one's, a, this one's a fun one. It means nose or 
metaphorically, anger. When somebody's angry and their their nostrils are flaring in and out, that's the idea behind this word. It's a metaphor for anger. When the anger of the Lord burned hot against Israel, off. His nostrils were flaring with anger towards the disobedient people of Israel. That's just one meaning. That's actually the most common, too. This one's used, it's translated this way, 277 times in the Old Testament. But there's also another translation. Also, indeed, or even. That's used another 133 times. Spelled exactly the same way. Off. Context, again, will help you in guiding you which translation to choose um, as well as the uh, the nose, you remember our dual um, our dual ending pair of nostrils um, or a pronominal suffix, which we we'll get to, which shows possession um, outside of the construct state. That will usually be attached to off, you'll know that it's talking about somebody's nose, maybe the fact they're angry, instead of also, indeed, or even. Because, ironically, nose is the more um, popular usage of that now. So, got a lot in today. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for This time we're able to study. We thank you for your word, the precious gift that it is to us. We pray that you would be with Pastor Little as he opens that word to us, that you would bless the message he has prepared, that you would glorify your son, that you would instruct us in your truth, that you would write your word upon our hearts, uh, that we might be glorified living thereby. We pray for your grace to help us in these things. Uh, We thank you for the promises that you make and that you keep to show forth your glory to bless your people. We pray in your son's name. Amen.